Dr. Eric Abelquist. He's the Deputy Director of Technical Services at UCOR. This is a cleanup contractor for the U.S. Department of Energy's Oak Ridge Reservation sites. So they're responsible for many of the decommissioning activities in the, in the surrounding area. Also author on this presentation is Mr. Tommy Morgan. He's a chief engineer at UCOR. So it's our pleasure to talk about the MSRE decommissioning challenges. So what we're going to do is talk a little bit about operational history of the MSRE and then provide an update of some of the decommissioning activities that have been performed over the years. For a, a reactor experiment that only operated for four years, we have such a wealth of data. It's widely known across the international community that this was the first molten salt reactor. Our job at UCOR is to work closely with the Department of Energy to come up with decommissioning strategies uh, for the MSRE. And you can see it's quite an unassuming facility. You probably could tell there's a little bit of age. A lot of attention is paid to MSRE uh, to make sure it's in a, a safe condition. You could see that it was an eight megawatt DOE test reactor that operated uh, mid to late 60s. It's currently a CAT2 nuclear facility. So for the, the safety basis categorization, it's uh, CAT2. It was initially fueled with 218 kilograms of uranium, and it was 30% U-235, 70% U-238, and that fuel mix was added to the carrier salt. Uh, a couple of years into its operation, it was actually refueled with a mixture of 80% uranium-233 and 20% U-235. And so it, it holds the, the, the distinction of being the first nuclear reactor to have operated with uranium-233. And then right near the end of its operational history, it was actually fueled for a period of time with plutonium-239, just demonstrated its flexibility as being a, a test reactor. The carrier salt was a mixture of lithium fluoride, beryllium fluoride, and zirconium tetrafluoride. And so we have a lot of information on that particular salt mixture. And I believe that's why we, we are doing a lot of experiments today for other salt mixtures, since those are candidate mixtures for today's MSR technologies. In the reactor vessel, the fuel salt was circulated through channels of graphite to provide the necessary geometry and moderation to sustain the nuclear chain reaction. What you're looking at there is the reactor vessel, two loop system. So you have the liquid salt flowing through the graphite moderator and then through a heat exchanger. That's where the heat was transferred from the fuel salt to the secondary coolant salt. And it operated at extremely high temperature. Um, the operating temperature was 600 degrees Celsius and that's why it could operate at uh, normal pressure, atmospheric pressures. So the coolant salt is uh, very similar to the carrier salt for the fuel, with the exception, of course, that there was no fuel in the, the coolant salt. But the coolant salt passed from the primary heat exchanger to an air-cooled radiator to a coolant salt pump and then returned to the primary heat exchanger. Bottom left center, you'll see the fuel drain tanks and the fuel flush tank. So these are where the salt is actually stored today. This is the carrier salt at temperature. It almost has consistency of water, uh, but at a much greater temperature than water could stand without flashing the steam. Reactor vessel with the graphite moderator, and there's actually three control rod thimbles that run through the, the center of the, the reactor vessel to maintain control for the reactor. And so for decommissioning, what we're really concerned with is the, the current condition of the salt and the facility today. Right now, the salts are cooled. It's probably best to think of it as a monolithic mass of salt. And that's what's in the fuel drain tanks. Very radioactive, beta and gamma radiation, principally cesium and strontium-90, constantly generating fluorine gas, both F2 and hydrogen fluoride, HF, 
through the radiolysis. The fuel drain tanks are each 80 cubic feet. Most of the uranium has already been removed from the fuel drain tank, so we still have uh, less than 2.5 kilograms of uranium in each tank. And Tommy's going to talk a little bit about some years ago where we actually removed most of the uranium from the fuel uh, drain tanks. But as I mentioned, it, these tanks are extremely radioactive, predominantly the fission products, cesium-137 and strontium-90. Any of the volatile fission products uh, were treated by the off-gas system, and they're, they're really not a problem today. Interestingly enough, uh, U-232 is an impurity from the U-233, and the, the health physics concern with uranium-232, once it's in equilibrium with its progeny, one of the decay products is thallium-208, and it has an extremely energetic gamma that has a 100% yield, so it's there all the time at 2.6 MeV. And so you see the exposure rates on contact uh, with the fuel drain tanks, 37 R per hour. So it's uh, significant radiation concerns for decommissioning. And also mention that the flush salt, thankfully, prior to the, the operational shutdown, the system was run through with a, a carrier salt, again, similar to the primary operating salt, but without uranium. This salt did pick up some uranium has some fission products in it, but it's not nearly as radioactive as the two fuel drain tanks. Near the right center of the picture, you'll see the reactor cell. And so that's where the reactor vessel is and complex piping. And then immediately to the left of the reactor cell, you see the drain tank cell. The first two tanks are the fuel drain tanks, uh, one and two, and then the fuel flush tank. So when we talk about decommissioning challenges, we usually highlight this drain tank cell as one of the, if not the most critical aspect of decommissioning. It's certainly up there uh, near the top. And then right above this tank, there used to be a shield block that's subsequently been removed. And now there's a portable maintenance shield that allows us to gain access through entry ports to this cell and actually be able to tap into the headspace of these tanks. The top one is the fuel flush tank, and then the fuel drain tanks are the next two, an extremely uh, high radiation area to work in. When we talk about decommissioning a reactor facility, a lot of times we think of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the different options that a decommissioned power reactor or test reactor or research reactor can choose, and those options include decon, safe store and entomb, which lately we've been calling it in situ D and D. And so just want to talk a little bit about each of these. Decon typically is something that we would do immediately following operations. Uh, we have staff on site that are uh, familiar with the operational history, some of the issues that may have happened during operations. And so there's a real benefit of decommissioning immediately after operations. One of the disadvantages is the, the facility is at its highest uh, level of radiation fields and that poses a challenge. And so a lot of times we end up in safe store where for some period of time, the facility is basically just uh, in a safe condition and that allows for significant radioactive decay to occur. That's sort of where we've been with MSRE, right? Consider that 1969 was when it shut down. There's been a lot of radioactive decay. And TOOM is similar to Safe Store, but this is where we specifically put it into a safe, usually crowded condition. And so I'm just gonna talk about each of these uh, real briefly. So DECON is the most popular option because it settles the decommissioning issue once and for all. So a lot of reactor facilities, they will choose decon, especially if there's enough funding for the decommissioning. And so, for example, uh, many commercial reactors set aside a decommissioning trust fund, and so there's adequate resources once the operational life is completed. There's a decommissioning trust fund and de decon has 
process can commence. One of the issues with DECON is that the waste needs a disposal option. And so Tommy's going to particularly point out this is one of the major challenges of MSRE. Where can we dispose of the salt waste? As I mentioned, Safe Store takes advantage of significant periods of radioactive decay. And for MSRE, I should mention that the salt was drained to the two fuel drain tanks, and that's where the salt is in a monolithic uh, condition today. And most of the, the uranium fuel has been removed. It was basically heated, fluorinated to UF6, and actually removed from the system to a large degree. Uh, safe store is often considered deferred dismantlement so that the decay levels can go down. For all of these years that a facility is in safe store, there's what we call surveillance and maintenance activities to make sure the condition is truly safe and there's no effluent liquid gaseous effluent coming from the facility. And the last one I'll talk about is Entomb. This is typically encasing portions of a facility in a structurally long-lived material. Typically we call that grout and there's different kinds of grout depending on the size of the void space. Again, for MSRE, what we're really talking about is grouting some of the other portions of the structure, not the drain tank cell, not grouting the salt, but the other cells that are adjacent to the drain tank cell, for instance. And so once you do entomb, the idea is this will be the lasting state for the facility and would need to demonstrate that it is in a uh, final condition for 60, 100, or even 300 years. So a lot of modeling is needed to demonstrate that the facility will be safe. And there's a lot of interest these days in in situ D&D, ISD, if you will, for um, looking at entomb technologies. I will turn it over to my colleague, Tommy Morgan, and he will talk about some of the decommissioning actions that we've taken to date. Like Eric said, MSRE is is really in a layup state or a safe store state at the moment. When I came to UCOR in, in 2016, one of the first things that I got to participate in uh, with the a few of you who are on the call actually is uh, doing an evaluation of how to stabilize this facility um, for a while. At the time, on this contract, this cleanup contract, K25 was the focus. Uh, we just recently accomplished our major milestones at K25. We've now started moving towards ORL Y12 objectives. And so th those facility stabilization activities are, are very important because MSRE was not one of the first facilities that that uh, we wanted to go after. Uh, we're going after some of the easier reactor facilities, isotope development facilities, things like that. Uh, so MSRE is a little farther down the list, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that we have done to stabilize the, the facility. Uh, unfortunately, D&D actions were forced upon us by uh, inadvertently pushing UF6 over to a, a charcoal bed uh, where it absorbed and uh, we had potential criticality concerns. Uh, so we actually removed, mined and removed a lot of that uranium out of the charcoal beds and we're, we're storing it in a shielded canister today. We inadvertently pushed UF6 uh, out of the drain tanks and into off gas piping systems. Um, and we unfortunately had a, a leaking valve. There's one valve between the off gas system and the charcoal beds. Uh, that valve failed sometime between reactor shutdown and uh, the late 80s when we first started noticing an increase in dose rate in those charcoal bed cells. We had to take a time critical action to remove the uranium, stabilize it, remove it, uh, put it in a, in a form that we could monitor it for um, for a while till we decided what to do with it. Um, interesting fact, uh, we, we just started a project with UT Knoxville, a senior design project where they're going to propose an alternate disposal path for uh, for this particular form of uranium, uh, and and hopefully they'll come up with something new and different that we haven't thought of previously. So what's in the the drain tanks today? Uh, the, the the fuel salt and the flush salts. Um, you know a lot of you are aware that we uh, removed a good amount of the uranium that was in the fuel salt from 2004 to 2008. Uh, loaded onto NAF traps and sent it off to another facility here at ORNL, and and they're going to deal with it as a part of their 233 campaign uh, in in future years. Mostly successful, not 
totally successful. The big thing that was kind of a, a bummer at the end of that was um, we had planned on transferring all of that salt to storage containers and then potentially starting to move it to permanent disposal locations. And that salt transfer was not successful and the project was abandoned and we've basically been in surveillance and maintenance mode ever since then. And so what does SNM look like at MSRE? Well, despite the fact that we're not operating the reactor, we still have fluorine that's off gassed from the fuel salt uh, at all times. It's not a lot, but it's enough to be a significant hazard. That's our biggest issue. Uh, so we have we have ventilation systems in some of these volumes to keep workers safe, and those are accredited safety systems because they're protecting workers from uh, potentially lethal amounts of fluorine and HF. Uh, obviously, we're monitoring radiation throughout the facility, general things like HVAC, because we got workers still at the facility at the moment. Something as simple as an overhead crane you think would be relatively straightforward. It's not. Uh, we've been working since 2017, 2018 to restore our 30 ton overhead crane and I'm literally about to sign out a recertification letter tomorrow to put that back in service. So in that old facility, stuff like that takes quite a while. So some of the planned upgrades, um, like I said, when I first got here, we, we started mapped out what would make sense. So there were some general facility upgrades we needed to do to stabilize the facility. We wanted to replace our current gas treatment system, which is uh, which was really meant just for that uranium capture project, but we're sort of repurposing it for the fluorine management at the facility. And then there's uh, a few D&D planning activities that we've got going on. So you can see all these things we have in the general facility upgrades, completed one of them, and then the rest of them are ongoing. The sump pumps surprisingly are very important because the water table for the facility is above the top of the tanks. So if you lose your sump pumps and you have a, a major water event, you could end up flooding the drain tank cell and the reactor cell. So that's a very big deal for us. The big thing we've got going on is what we're calling the continuous perch system at MSRE. It's replacing our reactive gas removal system. It was a concept that we had come up with back in 2016. It's a dilute and send out to the environment system, which again, is not, it's not ideal, but we're mostly just dealing with fluorine and HF. We will be pushing the fluorine out of the tanks with nitrogen and diluting it with large blowers and sending it out a new stack. I wish we could have gotten some more updated pictures of that system for you all because we actually have completed installing the stack and are starting to move into the facility with some of those installation activities. Uh, that'll be an enormous upgrade relative to RGRS. Just some of the challenges uh, doing all these preparatory and, and decommissioning activities. Uh, obviously the facilities, it's not really falling down around us, but uh, it certainly was not designed to accommodate workers uh, in today's with today's industrial uh, safety standards. So that's that's kind of the big thing is, is things are different today than they were when it, the place, this place was built. And so we're having to come up with creative ways to keep our folks safe while we do all these activities. And as Eric mentioned, I am going to talk a little bit about the salt waste form. And and before you fly fans like like Kirk blow up on me, you know, don't worry, we got lots of activities before that's something that we'd consider uh, down the road here. What do we get worried about day to day? What do we stay up at night worried about? It's this release of fluorine. Um, if one of these vessels uh, had a rupture, that would be a problem. We don't have a great way to isolate it if we had it. If we had a rupture, these heat exchanger tubes or Schedule 10 seamed pipe. We've not done non-destructive evaluation of the tube since 1999 or so. So, uh, needless to say, we, we are worried about that. So we maintain the tanks as close to atmospheric as we can to minimize differential pressure. Performing D&D &D with that portable maintenance shield, although it helps with dose, it's not that easy to uh, to work around. We got to maintain our ventilation system. You know, and these dose rates and activity levels are not anything that are going to shock any of you MSR developers. Um, but for us on our contract, this is a slightly unique hazard. We see these kind of dose rates very occasionally, but uh, not with the added chemical hazard component and the difficulty re reaching the some of these these places. And he here's kind of an idea of what it looks like down there. So there's this is a little picture of of me and Melanie Lindsay, who's now over with uh, our, our buddies out, out west and, and then Mark Smotnewski hanging out in the drain tank pit, uh, taking some measurements for this continuous purge system uh, that we're installing. I guess maybe we were looking at that winch or something. Uh, and you can see it's not that it's it's that complex down there, but it is it is tight. It is small. We do have a lot of interferences and working with long handle tools through the, this portable maintenance shield is is not that easy. And in fact, we actually had to redesign this eccentric plug tooling plug uh, assembly to accommodate installation for our new ventilation system. The biggest thing for decommissioning is the salt waste form. 
The fuel salt is the biggest thing. I mentioned before, our, our buddies at UT might help us with this uh, uranium laden charcoal issue. We're going to kind of kick that one down the road a little bit here for this discussion. Just for argument's sake, let's say we wanted to pursue disposing of the salt at WIP, stabilizing it and then sending it out to WIP. Is that actual, is it actually technically possible? Well, 10 years ago or so, we talked with our, our difficult waste buddies at uh, Los Alamos. They actually said it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibilities to classify the MS3 salt waste as transuranic waste that meets WIP waste acceptance criteria. Again, we have technical issues to resolve, uh, Department of Transportation issues, stuff like, you know, what do we do with the off gas that we know is going to come off no matter, you know, what we do. Maybe Dr. McFarland has an elegant solution that she'll share with us this week that'll help us with that pr particular problem. Summing it up, we're currently in this this safe store kind of um, state, but we do spend a lot of money. I mean, those Our current RGRS system that we use to trap fluorine each one of the with material costs going up and cost of labor going up. I mean, each one of these little chemical traps of which we use four or five a year, probably twenty five thousand bucks a piece. And that's just that's just that one piece. We have lots of things like that. Right. So it adds up really quickly. And we're exploring the entomb option uh, for some of the volumes. Again, we're not going to entomb around the, the drain tanks, but it could be an option for some of these other cells for stabilizing the facility uh, while we decide what to do with MSRE. And then decon, you know, Tommy's personal opinion obviously is as a resident of east tennessee you know decon is what we want um but it has its own challenges that we're, we're dealing with and just kind of a final note um there's still a lot of work to do msre although it's on the list of things to address in the next cleanup contract here in oak ridge which starts next year we have a long way to go before we're ready to turn this into a, a green field and then also just just to note uh, with this group in particular, there might be an opportunity. And again, I'm not I'm not representing the, the DOE here necessarily, but I'm just saying there could be an opportunity for an industry DOE partnership with regards to decommissioning the facility. If there are certain technologies or techniques or anything that you guys are developing that might help us accelerate D and D, you, you never know. Anyway, just keep in touch. Dr. Holcomb's got our contact info, and just reach out whenever whenever you want. That's it.